good morning. How's everybody doing? Are you good? I know you've already been. Yeah, good, 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 good. Hey, if you're watching online, thank you so much from wherever around the world you're watching. Hey, just let us know you're watching because we'd love to say hi to you in a very special way. If you're here today on this Labor Day weekend, isn't it kind of ironic that we don't work on Labor Anyway, Anyway, I hope that you have a great day off tomorrow. And if you don't, I'm so sorry. I hope today is a great day as you prepare for work tomorrow. Uh, but we are so glad that you are here. And my name is Bill. I am the lead pastor. And today, I want to just talk about a story. Now, stories are really important, and so my question for you is, what is your story? We all have a story, and our story is shaped by experiences we've had in the past, things that have been done uh, to us or things we have done, and so we all have a story, and what I want to talk to you today about really quickly is that if God wants to step into your story and make it a part of his story... That's what we're going to learn today, that God wants to take your story, wherever you're at, whatever you're going through right now, watching wherever you are in the world, or whatever brought you into this building, you just need to know that there is a God who is great, and he wants to step into your story and make it a part of his story. And what we're going to learn today is a little bit about the story of Central. So I just thought I'd do a little bit, something a little bit different. I'm going to just tell you six stories that shape who we are as a church. And I do this because we really want to invite you into being a part of our family. And so if I were to describe our story in one sentence, it would be simply this. Inviting people into a life that matters. Inviting people into a life that matters. So I want to tell you six stories. And they're really grouped in two categories. One, what we believe about God. And second, what we believe about our community and what we believe about you. You need to know that here at Central Community Church, we really do believe that there is a God who exists. We believe that when the Bible says in Romans 1.20 that since creation, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse, we believe that there is a God who exists and is shaping a story. And the great thing about this God is that we don't have to guess what he is like. Jesus came into this world, and he told us what we could expect about God. And the interesting thing is, at Central, we believe that God exists in Trinity. Now, if that's kind of a new term for you, let me just explain it really quickly the best I can, because I don't even fully understand it. But we believe it because God is above us, higher than us, greater than us. And we know that God exists three in one. Three persons, one essence. Now, I know, trying to get your head around that is, is a real big stretch, but here's why it's really important. Because God could have revealed himself however he wanted, but he chose it this way. And I'll tell you why it's really important. Because each of the three persons has a part to play in your story, if you'll allow them. And it also reflects the greatest truth about God, and that is that God is love. And love needs plurality to be expressed. You need someone else to love. So God is love, and because of this, he's always existed in trinity, in plurality, in greatness, greater than us. You say, well, why does that matter? Let me tell you why it matters. Let me tell you first about a story that reflects God the Father. We call it the story of the prodigal son. Now, if you grew up in Sunday school or you've read the Bible, you'll know this story out of Luke 15. If you haven't, that's okay. I'm going to tell you, kind of paraphrase it for you today. It's interesting that we call it the prodigal son because the word prodigal means extravagant. And the prodigal son is going to be one who extravagantly wastes his life. And we're going to identify ourselves with the prodigal son. But there's also a prodigal father in this story, and Jesus was talking about God. This is actually a story about God our Father, and he is an extravagant father, a God who loves. Now, I'm a dad, and I didn't fully understand the power of God as father until I became a dad. I remember the very first time I held my firstborn son in my arms, and they have it on video. I look goofy because I don't know if I should laugh or I should cry. I'm freaked out at the responsibility, and oh no, I did this. And I'm also going, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? Hey, dads, remember that first diaper? Never mind. Okay, I mean, it's nasty. Anyway, so, so, so I remember the responsibility, but in that moment, I also felt that I would literally have done anything in that moment for this life I held my hands. 
I had never felt this feeling so intensely and so strong. And I can tell you many stories about times when I wanted to defend my kids, fight for my kids. This morning was a really hard morning for me. I woke up at 4 o'clock to say goodbye to my daughter. Uh, she's going to BC to college, and I'm really excited for her, but I'm grieving because it's so painful because I can't be there to protect her. So, you know, Nico, her boyfriend's going with her, and I said, you take care of my baby because if something goes wrong, I'm holding you. No, I didn't say that. I just, I, I just threatened with my eyes. You know, you know, that, you know that, like that dad's like, you know, so anyway, um, but when you're a dad, you would do anything for your kids. And here's the point. In this story... Jesus says that there were two sons, and their father was very wealthy, and so the youngest son went to his father and said, you know what, I want what is owing to me. Now, now in that statement, we see the incredible arrogance of human nature, this idea that the world owes you something. And he says to the father, even though the father has done all of the work, created all of the wealth, and has given everything to this boy, this boy says to him, I want what's mine, give me what is mine. So the Bible says that Jesus said that the father divided his inheritance and gave it to his younger son. His younger son took it and he immediately squandered it on riotous living, is one translation in the Bible. You can fill in the blank. Whatever you think of as wild living, he blew it all. He took a gift that was meant to help him become a greater person and he threw it away. He was prodigal, wasteful, extravagantly wasteful with it. It gets so bad that he's bankrupt. A famine sweeps the country where he's gone to, and he can't get a job anywhere, and so he gets hired on to feed pigs. Now, in the first context, when the Jewish hearers heard this story, there was nothing worse than a pig. Pigs were unclean, they were dirty, they were filthy, and you weren't supposed to even be, have anything to do with them. And here this boy finds himself in a pig's pen, fighting with the pigs for their food. To those first hearers, it would have been absolutely the worst case scenario possible. And then Jesus says something pretty profound. He says, one day the boy came to his senses. He woke up. He looked around and realized, wait a minute, this is not the way it's supposed to be. I don't know your story, but if your story is anything like my story or the hundreds of people that I've talked to about their story, we all share something in common. We've all had the experience of making mistakes, having things fall short of our expectation, what we wanted or what we desired, what we went for and got and realized it was empty. We've all been in that place where we've hit rock bottom. We felt lost and confused. And in that moment, we've all had the thought, there's got to be something better. And if you've never had that thought, you just haven't lived long enough. There's got to be something better. There's got to be something more. And then he remembered his father's house. He remembered how even in his father's house, the servants ate well. In his father's house, the servants were clothed. In his father's house, there was no stress or anxiety because everybody was provided for. And so he comes to this own, his own logical solution. He says, listen, I will go back and beg my father. Please just, I know I don't deserve to be your son. I know I've blown it, but please just take me back as a slave. Please, father. And so as he rehearses this script, he begins the journey home. In his mind, he imagines that moment when he encounters his angry father, the father who wants to have nothing to do with him, probably has excommunicated him, the father who wants to embarrass and shame him, and yet he's just appealing to his father's mercy. But what he doesn't know is that the father every day stands on the edge of the property waiting and looking and longing for his son to come home. For his father had never excluded him from the family, always had treated him and loved him and believed in him as a son. And when the son comes over the crest of that mountain and their eyes meet, it says the father ran to his son. Not to beat him up or condemn him or tell him how awful he was or how disappointed he was. No, the father went with no words, simply and embrace. And the son quickly sputtered out the script that he had rehearsed so many times. Father, I don't deserve to be your son. Please take me back as a slave. 
And the father does something profound in the story. He takes a robe, a robe which represented the authority that was only to the name of that household, and he puts it over his shoulder, the shoulders of his son, and he takes a signet ring, which meant authority to make decisions on behalf of the family, and he puts it on his son's finger, and he says to his servants, kill the fatted calf, we're going to have a party, because my son who is gone has come home. And you just need to know that when we sing, we believe in God the Father. We believe in what Jesus told us about God our Father, that he is a loving, heavenly Father who waits not to condemn or punish or cripple us or laden us with lots of rules and regulations, hoops to jump through to somehow meet his expectation. No, he's a Father who runs to us. And when we deserve to be called slaves, calls us sons. This is the God that we serve. And so, yes, we're passionate. Yes, we're exuberant. Yes, we cheer. Maybe you've never been to a church like this before, but it's because we believe that God is our Father. And when we get that, it's an amazing, liberating thought. And so wherever your story is at, I've got great news for you. God is waiting to start a new chapter. No matter what the first part of your story is, God wants to step into your story and make it a part of his story because he has something great for you if you'll just believe it and receive it. But God also knew that we'd have a hard time believing that because God was far off. He was distant. We thought to ourselves, God, if you just show yourself, then I'd really believe. God, if I would just know, like beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so Jesus came. We believe that the second part of the Trinity is God, the Son, Jesus, who stepped into our world to show us that there was a way out of our pain. The second story I want to talk to you about is a story that every time I think about it moves me. It's a story, um, a modern story, of a mother and her daughter who are driving down the highway one day and in front of them, there was an accident, and as they were behind this chemical truck, the chemical truck tipped over and crushed them and pinned them under its uh, container. And the container burst and began to leak, and that, those chemicals uh, began to spread all the way around the car. Firemen came to the rescue scene, but as they came close, immediately flame leapt around the car. And this mother and her baby daughter were literally being burned alive. The mother was able to get her, her seatbelt off and she tried frantically to loosen free her child, but she couldn't. And the fire was getting so intense that it pushed her away from the car. And she ran away from that car screaming, please, somebody save my baby. Please, somebody help me. At this time, a fireman had come to the scene. The firemen were there. And one fireman did the unthinkable. He leapt into the chemical fire. And he tried to free the girl, but... He could not free her from her belt, so he did the only thing he could think of. He shielded her, to her with his own body. The chemicals burnt right through his gear, burnt his back horrifically. But in that heroic action, he gave that little girl enough time for the flames to be put out by his fellow firemen. In an interview after, they asked the firemen, why did you do that? Why would you do that? It looked like it was hopeless. Why, why, why would you risk your life for someone you didn't even know? And his answer was, when I heard that little girl screaming, all I could think of was my own little girl at home waiting for daddy to come home. And in that moment, I knew I had to do whatever I could to save her. See, the second thing that we believe is that Jesus stepped into our world full of chaos and confusion and pain. God saw us with the fire and the flame of circumstance seeking to consume us. And he did the unthinkable. He took our place. He stood between us and our brokenness, the mistakes of our past, our failures, our consequences. And he took the brunt of it. This is the point of the cross. And when you're tempted to ask, why would he do it? His answer would be, because all I could think of was you. All I could think of was you. There are a lot of people who think that Christians are narrow-minded, that they're ignorant, that they're not really open to the world. 
We're incredibly open to the world. You just need to know that it's central. We believe that every life matters, that everybody is important to God, but we do believe that there is only one way to be saved. Jesus stepped into our existence and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. What was he saying? Was he being arrogant or exclusive? Was he saying you had to join certain religious rites and rules in order to fit into God's box? No. He was simply stating a true fact that we cannot save ourselves, that we need a Savior to bring us back to the Father. Imagine with me, and I've used this story many times before, but imagine with me right now that in this room, smoke begins to fill the space. It's not going to happen. And if it does, we have an excellent fire plan, so you're okay. But imagine! And flames engulf us. And into the smoke, into the confusion, into the screaming, and the crying bursts a person, and this person is dressed in fireman in a fireman's garb. And that fireman says to you, listen, follow me, I know the way out. Which of you in that moment would say, excuse me, sir, um, I appreciate your enthusiasm, I appreciate your, your desire to help us, but there are lots of ways out. I know I came in, I've come in a different way last week and this week, there are lots of ways out. And, and he says, oh, I know we've, we've checked every, every exit is not consumed by fire, you've got, this is the only way. Which of you would go, hey, excuse me, sir, like, I know you're wearing the fireman outfit and you probably know a little bit about fire, but I happen to believe that that's a bit arrogant, that there possibly could be a lot of other people who could do this too. You know, so just, please, sir, just, just do your own thing and whoever wants to follow you, great, I'm just going to do my own thing. Which of you would do that? Well, you might. There's a word for it that I can't use in church. But we believe that Jesus stepped into our world not to force us into his mold, but to say, listen, I know the way out. Wherever your story is at, I want to write a new chapter, give you a new story, a new way of living your life. I got the way out. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 3.16 reminds us that for God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, will not die, but will have everlasting life. And so we believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus the Savior. But we also believe in the Holy Spirit. This is the third part of the Trinity. And this is important because as wonderful and talented and smart and industrious as you are, you can't reach God on your own. When I was a kid, um, I was fascinated with, with moon and space travel and, and landing on the moon. I actually believed when I was about 13 that the way technology was going, that we would actually be able to go to the moon by the time I was 30. That was, that's actually on my bucket list. Is that weird? To, is that kind of too geeky to acknowledge? I, I, I really want to go to the moon. I don't know why. I just think that'd be really cool. And before the 50s, it was kind of this just crazy science fiction. It was like, it was n not even plausible. Now, the reason was pretty simple. Um, I've met a lot of people who can jump really high. Like I coach volleyball, so I've seen some guys who can jump pretty high, but I've never seen anyone who can jump to the moon. And, and you're thinking, well, of course, what, what a stupid thing to say, but there are some people who think that they can jump to God on their own. Just think happy thoughts, think good things, do be a good person. If you're just good, listen, even if you were the best human being on the planet, even if you were the highest jumper like that Canadian Olympic athlete, well, that was pretty spectacular, um, even if you could jump eight feet, whatever, you cannot jump to the moon. It's impossible. And God realized because of our brokenness, we were so far separated from our Father that not only did we need to be saved, but we needed the power to walk in that way. And so when the NASA program was formed. They found a way to put liquid fuel in a rocket and they figured out to strap this guy to like liquid gasoline and shoot him with incredible power to land on the moon. It was unbelievable, but it required power, a power source greater than we were able to muster in our own strength to accomplish what was possible. And what we believe here at Central is that not only is God your Father who loves you just the way you are, but loves you too much to leave you that way, not only do we believe that Jesus kept, stepped into our world as our Savior and we need to follow Him, we also believe that the Holy Spirit, if we'll allow ourselves, is willing to come into our life and give us the power to do what we think is impossible 
For how is it possible in our own strength to forgive the person who has hurt us so deeply? How is it possible in our own strength to love the person who is our enemy and is trying to destroy us? How is it possible in our own strength to love the unlovely, to be generous when we live in a world that's so consumed with self and taking? How is it possible? It's only possible when we believe in a God who is our Father, who sent His Son Jesus to save us and gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to do what we need to do. And if you're here and these are new stories to you, new concepts to you, I just want you to know that you're not alone, that we're on this journey together and you don't have to have it all figured out. We don't either. But together we can figure this thing out and if you'd like today, you could just take the Central Connect card that's in the seat in front of you or the I'm in circle and fill out your name and a connection point and we'll connect with you. If you're watching online, the same thing. Just interact with your online pastor and we'll tell you more. Because God wants to step into your story and make it a part of his story. The second thing we believe is in our community, in our family. We want to invite people into a life that matters. So I told you in those first three stories what a life that matters looks like to us, what we believe the Bible teaches and what we've had in our own experience. But we also believe in people. One of my favorite uh, times of every day is when I get to go home and eat a meal with my family. Um, and so I want to show you a picture of my family. Um, this is a, a typical dinner. Um, and it's going to be changed now that people are all over the place. But um, uh, there you can see me there in the front wearing a Vancouver Canucks shirt, which everyone should own because um, um, they are by far the best team in the NHL. But anyway, um, so there, there's me, of course. And then right behind me is my youngest son, Garrett. Uh, my youngest, but my tallest. He's six foot six. And uh, you probably have seen him. And so Garrett is going into grade 12. And then next to Garrett, um, there's Nico. That's my daughter's boyfriend. And Tessa, my beautiful baby who just left me. Still love you anyway, Tessa. Um, and um, so that's Nico and Tessa. And then next to her is Min, our Korean student who was living with us at the time of this picture. We have a, a new uh, Chinese student, Vicky, who's living with us now. And then next to them is my beautiful mom and dad. Um, and then next to them is Macy, my oldest son Reed there, his girlfriend and Carlene taking the picture. And so I love, I love the family table. But I've learned a couple things about family, especially as, as we've grown older. We have taught our children to be independent thinkers. Uh, that's a mistake. Just, just teach them to conform and say yes ma'am to everything you say. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we, we've taught them to be independent thinkers and so we have some pretty interesting, heated, discussions at our dinner tables. Um, our dinner table is very lively because usually there can be this many and then friends added to that, so I never know when I get home exactly how many people are going to be eating, but that's great. Uh, we love it that way. And it's a family dynamic. And so we love that family dynamic where we love and care for each other, but here's what we've had to learn. We've had to learn that sometimes you've got to put your preferences aside in order to serve the family. So, when it comes to eating, I love onions. I love onions. I love onions on anything. I would eat onions on everything if I could, even my cereal. No, just kidding. That would be gross. Uh, maybe not. No, okay, anyway. Um, onions on everything, but my daughter doesn't like onions, so we don't have onions on things. Uh, I love olives. Love olives. Onions and olives. Come on, huh? See? You know what I'm saying? Okay, anyway, so um, I love olives and on onions, but my, one of my kids doesn't like olives. And then I have a child who doesn't like cheese. I know. I have prayed and fasted about it. <laughs> he will not eat cheese. Anyway, so, so there, are, there are meals when it's like, okay, listen, we, we, we try to accommodate everybody, and it's not because we're compromising, it's because we love our kids. So if I need olives, I can eat olives later. And I do. Because <laughs> they're awesome. Especially those green olives with little garlic inside. Oh, oh he's so good. And then we have this thing with our family, it's called responsibility. Kids don't like this word, but it's called how we work as a family. So on Saturdays, we'll go, okay, here's all the chores everybody gets to do. And you should see my kids, like, -ha -ha! it's like the highlight of their week. Uh, it's, just, it's just met with incredible enthusiasm and passion and intensity, yes, and they always do more than is expected. Um, and then I wake up and I really, um, but, but we do it because it's somebody has to mow the lawn. 
Somebody has to run the chore. Somebody has to clean the floor. Somebody has to fill the dishwasher. Somebody has to do it. We realize that in order for family to work, everybody has a responsibility. Otherwise, mom's the slave. And that's not family. Right, moms? I heard a lot, I heard a lot of amens right there. Okay. And dads, you don't lose your man card if you wash the dishes. Okay, um, just saying. All right, so... But here's how we treat our church family. We come to our church family, and if we don't get every preference we want, we have a fit. And we use words like, oh, well, I'm going to just go to another church there, then, because they have my preference. Or, well, no one cared about me. No one cares about me. I did this, and they weren't there, and I did this, and they, no one said anything, and I went there, and she looked at me that way. When I walked in the pregnant lot, I, I thought I was dressed all right, but they looked at me funny, and so oh, I don't like that family. And we realized that somehow along the way, we've missed it, that we are not a family of takers. Family doesn't take. Family gives. That's the only way family works. And what I'm about to say is going to seem a little harsh, maybe, and it's okay because we're family, right? We're just having a family talk. It's just your ADHD pastor talking right now. Um, <laughs> here's the reality. Not only do we believe in God, but we believe in each other. And what that means is that we are passionately committed to meeting together like this, even when we don't feel like it, even when we'd rather do something else, because we know that when we gather in this place and we sing like we sing and we talk like we talk, something happens to all of us. And that one handshake today could make the difference in someone's life. And then we invest in groups. And we invest in groups not because it's an inconvenient obligation in our already busy world. We invest in groups because there are other people like us who we can talk with and share life with and encourage when they need to be encouraged and be encouraged when we need to be encouraged. So when someone says to me, you know, I was sick and no one knew, it breaks my heart. But if you expect a few people to know everything about everybody, you don't understand family. And I ask, are you in a group? Or someone said, I went through a really rough time and no one knew. If you were in a group, I know they would have known if you could just been connected to other people and not just for what you could get, but for what you could give. And you say, well, I know groups aren't for me. Well, then they're for somebody else and somebody else needs you. So we're a family and we stick it out and we don't always agree. The great thing I love about our church family, you know what I love? Is that there's people from every kind of background represented here. Every kind of background. And I bet you, if we took a bunch of passages, we wouldn't always agree on every one of them. But what we've chosen to do is focus on what really matters, and it's family. Family matters. So the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, to let us consider how we can stir up one another to love and good works. I love that word in the Greek. You know the word, the Greek, stir there? Literally means to kick in the hindquarters. It does. It's the image of a cowboy with spurs kicking a horse in the hindquarters to get it to move. I think we're going to make that a t-shirt. I love you because I'm kicking you in the hindquarters. Okay, so I'm, but it's this idea that no, 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 don't just... Allow it to happen. Get actively involved. Get actively engaged in what God is doing. Become a part of the family. Contribute. Step up. Decide today that you're going to be in. It's not enough to be a spectator. We have spectators at our dinner table. We call them guests. Right? But when you come to my family, if you're from another country, you're in my family now. I will take care of you. And you have responsibilities too. It's the way family works. And so you just need to know that our arms are open wide to everybody. We are family. We aren't perfect. We don't have it figured out. We don't have every answer to every problem. But we do know what it means to trust God and to work together to figure it out. If you'd like to be a part of that, you're welcome to join us. And then finally, we believe in our community. Two last stories, um, really quick. The first story, um, it, we've used a lot, a lot around here. If you've ever been a part of like a partnership class or an introduction to next steps or something, you've probably seen this picture, but it, it's really important for you to understand it. It's a picture of a bridge. And, and you see here this bridge, and I don't know if you can see it from where you are if you're watching online. You can see that bridge in the bottom of the screen. And if you could look closely, you'll notice it's an absolutely fantastic bridge. 
I mean, it is engineered and constructed very, very well. And thousands of people have traveled over this bridge with incredible safety. It's been a very useful bridge for many, many people and maybe even some generations. But something's happened. The river shifted. In this picture, um, previous to this picture being taken, there was a um, kind of a, uh, a natural disaster, I guess, or a flood, and it diverted the river away. So you can see that C shape at the top there, and the river moved. So is there anything wrong with the bridge? Well, no. But what is it? It's no longer useful. It doesn't help anybody anymore because the river moved. I have the privilege of traveling all over our great country, and I get to speak to other pastors about our story. You you need to know that you're an inspiration uh, to churches all across Canada. They want to know how it's working, how you do it. Even with all of our flaws, I tell them quite openly about the things we've learned through our mistakes. We make a lot of them, but we're trying. And um, in that story, you know, I, I tell them, listen, here's the biggest problem. We can't keep doing it the way we've always done it. I think sometimes we get stuck on the bridge. I think sometimes we think, well, this is the way it happened, and so it's always got to happen that way, and we don't realize that culture has moved. Culture has shifted. Things aren't the same that they always were, and you can grieve that, but you need to move on. If you've never studied anything about millennials, you need to read something about millennials because they think completely differently than you and I do, and that's okay. (laughs) And you may think, well, they need to change. They aren't changing, and there's more of them than us. So we need to figure out how to engage, build a bridge into millennials. There's a lot of people in our community who have never, ever been to church. They, they've never been to church, and we think, oh, it's no big deal. Just come into church. It's easy. No, it's not. Think of any other religion in the world and ask your, think about when your friend, if your friend were to ask you to go into their place of worship, how you'd feel about that. It's not easy. And yet we think, oh, they should just do it. No, listen, we need to realize that being incarnational, which is the fancy theological word, the the biblical word for living where people are at, means building new bridges all the time. And so you just need to know that as a church, as long as I am the leader of this church, we will continue to push into new areas, try new things, experiment. Yeah, I know we don't always like it. I don't always like it. Let's talk about music for a second, shall we? Let's just do it. Let's just throw the elephant right out there and shoot arrows at it. Should we? Okay, let's do that. Um, When I was younger, there was a song that I absolutely loved. And some of you, okay, I'm going to just say it, and some of you are going to recognize it, and some of you are like, what are you talking about? It was, as the deer panteth for the water. See? Uh Every time I just think, as the deer panteth. Okay, never mind. Um, I love that song because when that song was sung in my life, it was a significant moment for me. It was a bridge that helped me move from where I was closer to what I believed God was and what God was saying to me. And so I love that song. But we will never sing it here on a weekend experience. Maybe we'll have a Thursday night and for all the as the deer panteth after the water, people can come and sing it with me. (laughs) Because it doesn't connect anymore with the next generation. It's not that the song was bad. It's not that the bridge was bad. It was fantastic. There's all kinds of great songs, all kinds of great things, all kinds of wonderful traditions that got us here. And we're thankful for that. But we just realized the river has shifted. We live in a political climate that's completely different than any other generation before us. We live in a world where sexual orientation is experimenting and exploring all kinds of new ideas and concepts, and it can freak us out or we can decide that we're going to build bridges, not walls. Because this is what Jesus did for us. If Jesus wasn't about building bridges, we'd all be done for. And so you just need to know that in our weekend experiences, I've had the incredible privilege of being here 15 years, have loved every minute of it, and we've seen all kinds of styles and changes, and we're going to keep changing. 
And I'm going to keep entrusting the millennials and those un- younger than me to lead me in this area, to show me new ways to make bridges into our community, to reach people who are far from God in a way that they understand so that when they come in, and it doesn't matter what they say about us, it doesn't matter if you think being called the rock and roll church is an insult, it's not an insult to me. I don't care if they don't understand, and I don't care if they say whatever, that we're not spiritual enough, deep enough, it really doesn't matter because as long as we're building bridges, we're making a difference and we're inviting people into into a life that matters, not into what we think or what we want you to be or some box that we have prescribed for you, but rather into a life that God has for you. So it's a journey and we're inviting you in. And if it means we need to build a new bridge and tear down the old one, we'll do it. We will do it. And as long as I'm the lead pastor, you just need to know that I'm passionate about that. Because Jesus told us to go and make disciples of all nations. And sometimes it means doing things differently in order to see that happen. You say, so why are you like this? <laughs> I finished with my final story. I want to show you a picture of some cute little kids. Um, aren't they cute? Can anyone guess who they are? The uh, little girl on the far left is my mom. Yeah. And in the middle there, that's my Uncle Billy. Uh, I was named after him, and my Auntie Pam as kids. This picture is not a true reflection of their reality in this moment. My mom's story was not always easy. She grew up in a home where her mom and dad were far from God. Her stepdad was a, uh, in the Navy, and her mom... Um, was very creative with her language and her emotions. My mom tells a story of one day when she was about eight years old and she was the oldest. There's a, there's a, th- a fourth son, um, my Uncle Eddie, who's g- g- going to come later in, into the picture. But when she was about eight years old, she remembers hearing her mom and dad coming home from a, from a party with a whole bunch of people. And she was so afraid for her, for her, her family that she took her brother and her, her brothers and her sister into a closet and they hid in the closet to avoid the emotional abuse or whatever could have happened. And when she heard the noise dying down, she walked out of that closet and walked over the bodies sprawled all over the house and tried to find some food because they hadn't eaten that day. My mom grew up in a home where She didn't know that there was a God who loved her. She didn't actually know that anybody loved her. At eight years old, she was saddled with the responsibility of trying to be a mom to her brothers and her sister. And then one day, there was a little country church. And this little country church believed the same things I've talked about today, that there was a God who loves us as a father And he sent Jesus to save us from our situation. And he gives us the power by his spirit to overcome every obstacle so all things are possible. And this little church understood what it meant to be a family, that they would welcome anybody with open arms, not to condemn them, but to help them find a better way, the way that they had discovered themselves. And so they built a bridge. For them, that bridge was a bicycle doesn't seem like that big of a deal to you, or maybe it seems gimmicky to you, but this little church decided that they were going to give a bicycle to the kid who brought the most people to to their church for a certain Sunday. Kind of like a a cruise. (laughs) My mom had, had never owned a bicycle, ever. Actually, they were so poor that the thought of owning a bicycle was so radical to that whole family. When her mom found out, she said, we're bringing everybody. So they brought all of my, my mom's brothers and her sister, her mom, her dad, her uncles, her aunts, her cousins. Uh, they brought my great-grandparents, her grandparents. They all came and they all experienced the life-transforming power of God. So much so that it radically shifted that whole family. My grandmother, into her 60s, was working with YWAM, Youth with a Mission, Yeah, at 60, on mercy ships, going into areas that had been devastated by floods or disease and bringing relief in the name of Jesus. My grandmother. 
My grandfather, when he passed away, was having a heart attack, and he was on the doctor's uh, table, and the young doctor was on top of him, trying to resuscitate him, pounding on his chest. The monitor that was connected to his heart was flatlined. He was dead. He was done. And in that state, my grandfather reached up, took the hands of the young, fa- uh, the young doctor and said, Son, thank you for all you're doing, but it's okay. I'm going home. And he went away. Needless to say, that doctor and the two nurses that were there were a little shaken up by that experience. And they came out to my grandmother and they said, what just happened? And at my grandfather's funeral, all three of them made a decision to change their life and allow God to become part of their story, to write his story. I could tell you about my mom. and My mom is like a hero to me. Because she overcome incredible adversity and yet she is full of grace and love and she just loves people. She always has people over into her house and she's telling them about this God who loves them. My mom is fired up and passionate. My dad, who she married, was a pastor. He took us to Thailand, to the mission field. I have been blessed because someone, a church in a country, in a little country church in Washington State, loved people enough to try whatever and do whatever to reach people so they could know what you're hearing today. And so I'm just committed to reaching more people just like my mom. People who don't even know yet that there's a God who loves them. People who don't even understand yet that there's a better way. People who don't even know this amazing truth. And sometimes we are just too satisfied to sit contently by and watch it happen. And we even have the audacity, like the older brother in the prodigal son story, to be upset or angry with the way people are behaving or living. When God says, grow up and invite them in to the family. And so we're going to be a church. that is going to continue to invite people into a life that matters. And if you want to be a part of that, we'd love it. We'd love it because one of us can't do it, two of us can't do it, 10 of us, 20 of us. It's going to take all of us to say, I'm in. And to do whatever we can to reach people with this amazing message. And so if you're here today and you don't like your story, welcome to a church family that's trying to rewrite our story allowing God to step into our story and writing his story. And today could be your day too. If you're watching online, why not just click the button right there in front of you and follow up with the online pastor. If you're here today, why not take a moment to fill this out and join the family today. God, I thank you so much for this time we could have together. You're so good. You're so good and I thank you that I'm in a family that loves me just the way I am, faults and flaws and all. And that today we could just talk through stories about how awesome you are and what you want to do for us. And it is my prayer and my honest desire that the entire Niagara region would at least know this amazing love. God, that we would be a group of people who are so committed and so passionate to this message of the kingdom that we'll do whatever it takes. God, we will not hold anything back. Because we've experienced it. If we've truly experienced it, we just want it for everybody else. And so, God, we may not be able to do everything, but we can do something. So, God, I pray for those in this place right now who've never made a decision to follow you, and maybe this is the first time they've heard some of these stories, but inside they know they need to change. I pray, God, that you'd give them the courage right now, like the prodigal son, to come to their senses and go back to the Father's heart. Acknowledge that Jesus is their Savior and trust your Spirit to empower them. And for those of us who've had that experience, I pray, God, that you would empower us to even greater things in the future. God, because I do believe all things are possible to those who love and trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. And so let me bless you today. But before you go, if you want to respond in any way, there is a connection card in front of you. Take that connection card or this I'm in card. There'll be a prayer team here at the front. They would love to pray with you if you need prayer. Or you can drop it off in one of the four boxes on your way out. Or you can go to Central Connect, the great big blue wall just outside these doors. But here's what I bless you with. I bless you with the fact that no matter what your story is today, God wants to write a new story. And I bless you with the fact that if you will believe and trust in him, he will give you the power by his spirit to follow Jesus, his son, the Savior, back to the Father's heart. For this is what you were created for. 
If your story looks like a story of slavery, let God change it to a story of adoption. Become a son or daughter. And as a son or daughter, rise up and invite others to the family table so they may experience it too. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.